Hello again, it's me. Have you ever, like, really liked a character? I'm not talking, like, attracted to a character. I just mean, like, the character just really makes you think about stuff. I have a character like that, and today we're going to be talking about them. That's right, this is another anime video. Put it on the playlist. The topic of today's video is one specific show, or more accurately, one specific character from that one specific show, who goes through such powerful development that I just had to talk about it. But anyways, uh, what show am I talking about? Well, that show is my second favorite anime of all time. Hoseki no Kuni. Or Land of the Lustrous for the non-weebs out there. If that still isn't ringing any bells, it's the silly 3D animated, very pretty looking gem people show that got upstaged hard by Beastars and has been cucked out of a second season because people like the furries more. I'm still mad. Well, uh, honestly, though, we're not really going to be talking about the show that much. This is mostly about the manga. So, hey, if you haven't read the manga yet, do yourself a favor. It's so fucking good. It made me make an entire video about it. Anyways, this video is going to be a complete overview and analysis of how Land of the Lustrous treats its main character and how it treats the development of a character over immense, near-unfathomable periods of time. Either way, let's start this out with a quick setting overview before we get into the proper plot synopsis. Land of the Lustrous takes place on an island, the last remaining landmass in a world which previously had humans, but they've all gone extinct. To clarify the spoilery part of this, the humans were split into three pieces. Bones, flesh, and spirit. The bones turned into a race of gem people, the flesh turned into a race of weird jellyfish people, and the spirits were sent to the moon and became weird ghost people called Lunarians. That's pretty notable, and obviously spoilered, but hey, it's basic understanding that we're going to need. The gems are the main focus. They are artificial rock beings made of minerals, specifically gemstones like rubies or amethyst or, well, phosphophyllite. Our main character is phosphophyllite, a weak, shitty gem that kind of sucks at everything they try to do. Also, uh, j just to clarify, the pronouns of the gems are really weird and rely a lot on translation, so I'm just going to use they, them, because I, I don't know... Uh, this is a genuine discussion in the fandom, and as far as I know, all three are valid, but I'm taking the safest option because I'm a YouTuber, and not being deplatformed is my fucking job. The main goal of the gems is to not die to the Lunarians, who are apparently trying to steal them and make jewelry out of them. Their goal isn't really clarified, and it's theorized a bit, and it's kind of, like, really important, so we'll get to it. The gems all reside at the school a massive stone building where they are raised and taught by Adamant, a strange, bald, monk-looking guy who is seemingly stronger than all of them. This existence has seemingly gone on for millennia, and will continue onwards because none of these characters can actually die, they just can get destroyed, but they can always be put back together. They're basically completely immortal. So, the story starts out with Foss, which is what I'm going to call him because one syllable is better than four. Anyways, Foss is trying to get a job so they can stop constantly doing nothing. Gems are rated based on hardness. I recall the hardest is 10, which is what Bort and Diamond are. Hardness determines how easily you break. A gem breaking involves them literally developing cracks and then falling to pieces. A gem's body is technically all of their form. A gem can arguably survive from being completely reduced to dust if enough pieces are reconnected. They're basically colonial organisms, arguably. Foss has a hardness of 3.5. They get fucking demolished by falling a bit too hard or getting looked at by a Lunarian with a weapon. The first episode eventually ends with Foss trying to find a job for Cinnabar, who was constantly an outsider and put on night watch due to the deadly corrosive toxin that surrounds them. So we have our basis, a character who is by all means happy, but weak. This is important as we assess the character's changes over time, the happiness versus power scales. So, at their weakest, Fos is an energetic little scamp who mostly gets up to no good and ends up needing to be saved by others more often than not. Most of the episodes involve them getting eaten or smashed or otherwise destroyed multiple times over. They get consumed by a snail and then become the snail. It's weird. Anyways, eventually Fos's first change occurs as they are swept out to sea and meet with one of the weird jellyfish people that I mentioned before. 
that jellyfish person ends up betraying them, and their legs get torn off and taken by the Lunarians. However, that jellyfish person's brother gives them some pieces of their agatized flesh that the doctors carve into heavy, strong legs for foes to use. Now, uh, to mention, whenever a gem loses a piece of themselves, they lose a proportional amount of memories. So Fos has just lost about 30 to 40 percent of their memories with their legs. These new legs are strong. They allow Fos to run much quicker and allow them to actually get some work done around the school. Fos is at the happiest and most powerful that they've ever been. Useful, strong, but burdened by that loss of memory and the struggle of their own body. The next change comes when Fos takes on the winter duties, as most of the gems have the gayest slumber party ever during the entire winter, and a gem called Antarcticite takes up all the duties during the winter. In this arc, Fos joins Antarc. It, uh, it, it doesn't go well. The first job is to clear ice sheets, which are also technically the AI that ended the world and also Adamant's brother. I guess. I don't know how, but the these pieces of ice are also the eyeball that... Okay, whatever. This series is weird, uh, but uh, the ice sheets, they chop off Fos' arms. So, armless, Fos returns to the school, and they have to start the search for new arms. They find the Shore of Nascence, which is probably one of my favorite ideas that the show ever brings up. It's this giant wall that forms gems that physically fall out of it, half-formed and shatter on the ground. It's pretty fucked up. Anyways, uh, they find some gold platinum alloy and slap it in and it doesn't work, and Phos has to watch as Antarcticite is ambushed by some Lunarians and taken away. This is the first loss that Phos truly experiences up close, and it weighs on them for the rest of the series so that they can remember this. Phos has lost a lot of themselves at this point. Both arms and both legs have been replaced. But both of these new additions have made Fos stronger, and the alloy is probably the greatest addition that they ever get. They quickly learn to master that heavy liquid metal that runs through them, using it to form structures and eventually take up the job that Antark left behind. Over the course of the remaining winter months, Fos grows genuinely strong using that powerful alloy to annihilate the Lunarians and becoming almost an entirely different person. The power here spikes incredibly high, reaching almost bored levels of strength. But the happiness for the first time takes a bit of a dip. They're still quite satisfied, but that loss weighs on them. That guilt prevents them from feeling that same innocent joy that they felt before. Anyways, uh, Bad Bitch Fos does a lot for a good bit, and this is where the anime ends and the manga begins. So if you haven't read that yet, here's your final spoiler warning before I just d jump whole hog into it. So, what happens next? What part of Fos is lost now? Where do they go from here? Well, uh, not much happens for at least two arcs, but after a while, Fos is now strong enough to kick it with the big boys or girls or genderless rocks that use pronouns, but it's it, whatever. They spend most of their time fighting off increasingly dangerous threats, eventually discovering a gem called Kyrngorm, and then losing their head to save them. Fos's identity was already questionable. We didn't know how much of Fos was left in that body, but now it's even more questionable as their new head comes from a deceased gem called Lapis Lazuli. Fos rests seemingly dead for 102 years. When they wake up, something strange is afoot. They act very differently, seemingly having had their entire personality shifted, starting from Genki, becoming serious but still slightly aloof, to much more intelligent and kind of creepy with their speech patterns, at least for a bit. There are shots showing this identity crisis, this question of how much of them is Fos and how much is Lapis comes up quite a lot. Not to mention the fact that Fos seemingly now has the ability to perceive things in much greater detail, likely thanks to literally gaining a new pair of eyeballs. Eventually though, Fos grows accustomed to their new head and that disparity starts calming down, and questions start getting answered. Questions like, what are the Lunarians? What's it like on the fucking moon? And what happens to the gems that get abducted? Eventually, Fos ends up sneaking onto the moon and learns the truth of the Lunarians. They're not evil jewelry makers, they're the closest things to humanity looking for a final way out. 
Over their time on the moon, Phos grows almost friendly with the Lunarians, gaining a new look to fit their new alliance, alongside a new eyeball made of a pearl, another piece changed out and replaced. This new alliance eventually pits Phos and the Lunarian gems against the Earth gems. This isn't something that came out of nowhere, though. Throughout the story so far, Phos has been looking at their father figure, their teacher, Adamant, with increasingly suspicious eyes. He's not a gem, he's not a jellyfish person, and he's not a Lunarian, but he's also not human. What is he? Well, he seems to know a lot about some of the more mysterious elements and strange things that have been seen. Knowing the Lunarians could speak the whole time, reacting with fear and anger to certain visages of unknown individuals, and then pretending like he doesn't know who they are after they're gone. Those constant lies caused Faust to get quite angry with him, and that culminates in a nighttime raid on the school. At this point, Faust has gone from a weak creature with seemingly no use, made entirely of one weak gem, to a powerful hybrid gem with all that's left of the original being their torso. They now seek to hold a sort of rebellion, their own personal happiness taking a backseat to this ever-expanding power and their duties. The Lunarians state that Adamant is a broken machine, an automaton designed to properly kill all the remains of humanity simply by praying for them to vanish. Fos' mission is to retrieve their master, or at least convince him to pray, but the gems simply see them now as a traitor that allied with the lunar fiends who broke and took their friends so many times over. Fos' love and respect for their teacher has now turned into hatred, and Bort cannot deal with it. So they clash, and Bort wins, bisecting them and causing the Lunarians to retrieve the pieces of Phos, but not before breaking them even further, so they could not resist being taken back. Their first attempt having failed, Phos lives happily for a bit before returning to Earth alone to try to speak with their teacher. The only thing the Lunarians want is nothingness, to be prayed away into non-existence and be freed. But their release is stifled by Adamant, and Phos seeks to convince him to finally let them and the gems and the jellyfish people go. They attempt to fraternize with the gems for a bit before Bort uh, instantly fucking annihilates them with a whip, but is gracious enough to allow their pieces to see Adamant. They beg their teacher to pray for the pieces of his creators, so tormented by life, but Adamant refuses. And as Phos reaches out, they are once again cut into innumerable pieces and spread out across the island as punishment by the gems. 220 years pass like this, Phos resting in a thousand pieces, and the gems eventually forget about their transgression, and them entirely, but Adamant had not. Adamant reassembles Phos, and Phos begs as their body falls apart without any of their memories, but that core person still being there, they beg for the life full of rage and hate that they found themselves in to end, for their teacher to pray not for the Lunarians, but for them. They can no longer find the will to go on. And do you feel it? Do you see the reason why I made the fucking happiness versus power graph? Yeah. Phos is now an entity of resentment, hating the fact that they have to continue onwards, but they are forced to as their only way out is actively refusing to let them be free. Also, off-topic, they look fucking awesome. This is easily my favorite Phos design. It's awesome. They leak their alloy everywhere and look like a skeleton, a representation of the seeming zombification of a character who has been changed and killed and revived over and over and over again, losing all that once made them who they are, with only the resentment and pain they accumulated along the way remaining, in place of their memories. Phos lunges towards their teacher and ends up waking up the other gems, before fleeing the scene and being taken back to the moon, as all their former friends hunt them down like some sort of escaped convict. Phos has not lost their will to live, the only thing remaining within them is their desire to die, and their desire for revenge against the gems that now serve as their main roadblock. Phos is convinced that Adamant still loves them. He recreated them, so he must. 
They will try again, but only after they're done turning every single gem on that planet to dust. This panel goes immeasurably hard. I wasn't kidding when I said that this was the best fucking Faust design. It's so badass. Anyways, Faust gets mollywopped by the weird dog and then gets reassembled. However, before being fully reassembled, they escape and eventually leave prematurely to Earth, which I don't mind because they look fucking awesome when half reassembled. Their hatred now is the only thing they have left, but they are stronger than ever before. Their only drive to crush all gems and finally be set free. Here's where we get the next Fos form, now with a giant plume and spike sticking from their neck and back, truly having become monstrous in their appearance, without anything more than an eye to resemble a proper face. They appear weirdly regal, and it's awesome. This is probably my second favorite part of the entire manga. Yeah, it, it gets better. I want to remind you that this fucking demon warlord with evil gold tentacles and a giant collar used to be uh, this little Genki anime girl. Yeah, that's why I'm making this video. Anyways, Fos makes the coolest fucking entrance ever with a million sunspots opening and them sitting on a throne as they look down with pure hatred at their former friends who they now intend to shatter. The Lunarian Gems fight through the school, with Fos following behind as the Earth Gems are massacred, having had no fighting experience in centuries thanks to the Lunarians having stopped their constant invasions. Anyways, the next chapter opens with the phrase, The most human emotion is vengeance. Huh. Weird, I wonder what that could be implying. Fos eventually meets with Euclase, who begs them to stop, that they still need Fos before Fos quickly decapitates them with the statement, I don't need anyone at all. Fos then fights Jade, there's not much to say here, I know I'm just kind of reading it off beat for beat, but like, come on, I gotta. It's one of the best parts. Eventually, Fos meets with Cinnabar, remember them? I barely do, they kind of stop being important once Fos forgot about them, but here they work as a reference material for Fos, whose growth pulled them away from Cinnabar, their original goal. Now they meet as enemies on the opposite sides of the battlefield. Fos and Cinnabar's fight is awesome, and I really hope it gets animated. The Alloy and Mercury fight like crashing waves, and Fos is overtaken, but persists despite having most of their original gem body now being washed away and melted by the Mercury. What's left of the original pure phosphophyllite is barely more than some pieces attached by that ever-present writhing alloy that was used to murder all of their past friends. And Cinnabar isn't immune to it either. The fight ends with a deadly rush, the two fluids mixing together into a heavy, burdensome substance that coats Phos, with Cinnabar eventually melting into nothing, their final words being a thanks to Phos for that promise they made so many centuries ago. That fluid weighs them down as they approach Adamant's desk, finally ending with it overtaking them, turning them into something that looks so notably like a human. As they wander, they eventually see a vision of their past self, happy, not burdened with rage and duty and praying and all that nonsense, a pure innocent foss, which they don't even recognize. The amalgamation reaches Adamant, where they beg him to pray, but he still refuses. So in a fit of rage, they give the command for Adamant to break, a command which he follows. Adamant states that he has been waiting for so long for a proper human to tell him that his work is done. He then is reduced to a pile of dust and grants Fos his right eye. Through this eye, they see a world tormented by humans, the meteors that wipe them out. And as they rest on the shores where gems are born, Adamant's spirit gets taken to the moon, and he states that in order to transfer his powers fully to the new divine being, it will take millennia. And as they all partied up on the moon, Faust rests with an existential crisis on the beach, completely still, for 10,000 years. Oh yeah, by the way, sorry to ruin the mood, but the fucking series went on hiatus for around eight months after this chapter released. The author literally told us to, quote, have a pleasant 10,000 years, and then went to play PlayStation for eight months. Anyways, uh, that was a suffering you didn't have to deal with. After that, Fos wakes up with this new angelic form, a new deity, born to pray away all that rested there before. 
Falsh now remembers everything about their life. And they have the power now to force everyone to be their slaves for eternity. But they choose not to take that vengeful path. For they have truly always been alone, according to them. Their claim before praying that their only desire was nothingness. And in that they finally understand each other. Before they reduce all that remains of humanity to non-existence. But that's not where it ends. You see, the manga is currently in its epilogue, and this is why I made this video for real, because the epilogue is fantastic. I won't read it out entirely to you like I did this last arc, but it consists primarily of Godfos talking to rocks and figuring out all their own mental issues. I mean actual rocks, like spherical stones, and they're weirdly better for Fos than any of the actual gems. They actually support Fos and allow them to reflect, and it might just be my single favorite arc in any manga ever, or at least my second favorite, because this guy exists. But that's off topic, read it for yourself, it starts at chapter 99. Honestly, for this entire video so far, I've just kind of been getting you up to speed with the manga, so let me get more into my official analysis of Fos' character. Alright, so let's start this off by designating the stages of Fos's life before we analyze them. So, from start to finish, we have Genki Fos, Genki Fos, Thigh High Edition, Serious Fos, Serious Fos with blue hair and pronouns, Lunarian Fos, Sleep Paralysis Demon Fos, Badass Fos, Human Fos, God Fos. Going through all of them, including our graph, Genki Fos is more or less useless in a fight, but happy aside from their feeling of uselessness. It's only after they get their thigh highs, aka new legs, that they begin to feel useful and begin to take on more difficult jobs, though this stage is still marked by that first loss of a body part and important memories with it. Also, they're not exactly strong enough yet. Sirius Fos comes after a traumatic event and features Fos at their strongest so far, rivaling even Bort in combat prowess. But this stage is marked by a loss of that pure innocence and a feeling of solemn duty to get their lost friend back. The happiness begins to wane. New Head Fos is kinda similar, but beginning to toe the line on how much of Fos is truly left, and their suspicion towards Adamant only has them lose another important connection in their life. Lunarian Fos has just recently had their entire desires upended, and they have put their happiness on the back burner, favoring their new duty. To put together the Lunarians and gems, and get Adamant to pray. Shattered Fos is just that, but more. The strength has plateaued, but the happiness just keeps going down, hitting a record bottom. Fos loses all purpose besides the desire to vanish, and happiness is at an all-time low. Evil Fos is the culmination of this. A feeling of hatred is all that's left as they've lost most of their happy memories, and now have nothing left but that anger. Now Human Fos is barely there, it's more just a transient stage where Fos has lost all of what made them who they were, left only as a shambling husk seeking an end to their own existence. And then we get God Fos, where the power has gone through the roof, but happiness still lies near the bottom. Fos isn't filled with joy, anger, or sadness, but a profound emptiness and exhaustion. God Fos is the conclusion of the arc, where Fos has destroyed and solved every issue and entity before them, and is left alone with nothing but rubble. But perhaps in that rubble they can finally build something. They can finally choose to work on themselves. They have nothing else to do now, after all, and are weirdly finally saddled with important and valuable relationships for the first time. People who appreciate Fos for Fos, not for their strength or their usefulness to their cause, or anything along those lines, just for being themselves. And they're rocks! Well, the gems are rocks too, but these are just rocks. Uh, and a walking eyeball spider, he's, he's my favorite. But anyways, Stories are designed to end. They have a beginning, a middle, and a conclusion. But what happens when a story doesn't end? Or at least tries desperately to end, constantly? When its main goal is an ending that seemingly just gets pushed back? You can see this in the shonen slogs like Dragon Ball's immortal, infinitely powercraft universe that's kept going far past when it should have ended or the endless reboots of long-dead series that try to cash in on what was previously a good ending, 
but honestly, I don't think it's that bad. The issue isn't that Goku hasn't died yet. The problem is that the series is just trying to stay the exact same, trying to appeal to that same demographic that got it popular, cycling the same action set pieces and same character dynamics constantly. I think Land of the Lustrous is a fantastic example of how to keep a narrative going to the point of breaking without making it boring for a second. The kind of narrative that can take several century to millennia long time skips and incorporate them into the story well enough that it gets me invested over and over again. Land of the Lustrous doesn't end. It dies. Slowly it loses more of itself. That cutesy, horror-tinged, slice-of-life adventure show turns into an esoteric nightmare piece seemingly devoted only to the torture of its main character. Characters can be defined by their changes. Stagnant characters are usually boring characters. Dynamic characters can live forever. Force is the best example I can think of for how to write a character that is defined by change. Force's personality is kind of shallow, honestly, mainly because it's constantly being stripped away and replaced. Land of the Lustrous is not a series that's defined by its characters. Rather, the journey of one character and the connections they make. It has few super compelling side characters, at least in my opinion. It kind of glosses over most of the individual arcs. Hell, it barely has an antagonist. But it still manages to be incredibly gripping and compelling despite it. There's no holy grail writing tip I can give from this series. I mostly just wanted to bring it to light and talk about it in a video. To wrap things up, I do want to point out a scene from the epilogue. Fos is speaking to a rock person, the stationary kind, and as they give their thoughts, it strikes a chord in Fos that causes them to reflect. Fos turns around and looks behind themselves metaphorically at the path they've taken, and they realize something about themselves. The only thing they ever wanted was to be loved, that core insecurity and weakness. They sought constantly to gain more, to get stronger, to know and learn everything, to solve everybody's issues purely for the approval of others. They sought to help their fellow gems, then to free the Lunarians, then just to die. But they never stopped to think about what they really wanted, and now they can't have it anymore. They become a deity, the most powerful thing of all, but they only now realize that they have lost all the things that made them happy. And I think that the remaining chapters of the epilogue are going to focus on them slowly restoring that graph back to its original balance. But there's no way to tell. Oh yeah, Land of the Lustres isn't, isn't over yet. Uh, it probably still has like three chapters in it, but they're coming out in spring of 2024. Yep. Another fucking eight-month hiatus. I was originally going to make this video afterwards, but after the hiatus was announced, I figured, fuck it. I'll just make it now. It, anyways, uh, thank you all for watching me rant about things I like. Have a pleasant 10,000 years, and I'll see y'all in the next one. Goodbye.